Okay. So the first speaker on our second panel today is Dr. Catherine Bond. Catherine is a Government of Ireland postdoctoral research fellow at the School of History, University College Cork. She's currently working on a monograph about costume books in the visual culture of early modern Europe. Originally from New Zealand, she studied art history at the University of Auckland before completing a PhD in history at the University of Cambridge on the subject of 16th century costume albums during the reign of the Habsburg Emperor Charles V. Her research centres around the visual and material culture of early modern Europe with a particular focus on dress practices, ethnography and cross-cultural exchange. Her paper today explores the role of clothing in English colonial ideologies in Ireland and Virginia. Um, I will be discussing more the idea of clothing in English colonial thought at the time, as opposed to what people were wearing precisely, um, which I think is perhaps the more interesting subject, in fact, is how the English at the time were conceiving of dress and how it impacted um, their colonial activities, both in Ireland and also over in Virginia. So I'll get going. When Daniel Gookin and William Neuse decided to invest in the Virginia Company in the 1610s, the two English colonialists would already have had an idea in their mind about the native population and this capacity of them to be colonised, according to um, views that had already been uh, propagated. It's likely that they had studied, amongst other things, the first official report on the colonial potential of Virginia, written by Thomas Harriet in 1588. That report, which many of you probably know of, referred to Roanoke Island in present-day North Carolina, where attempts in the 1580s to establish a colony ultimately failed, despite Harriet's enthusiasm about fertile lands and industrious people. From their experience as planters in County Cork, Gookin and Noose would have been well versed in the idea that successful colonies not only required the import of settlers. In Ireland, the idea that the native population should embrace the customs and manners of the English was firmly established by the late 16th century. Proclaiming himself King of Ireland, Henry VIII had earlier enacted many clothing ordinances to suppress Irish dress in favour of English clothing. And by the mid to late 16th century, vocal supporters of the plantation programme, such as Edmund Spencer and William Herbert, promoted this policy. The adoption of English customs, including modes and fashions, was central to the concept of civility that colonialists often repeated. And this concept, as we'll see, migrated from Ireland over to North America. Although opinions surrounding the dress of the Irish and North American Indians often differed in character, with the Irish receiving far harsher criticism as a result of a closer cultural proximity, um, if these, but one idea was held in common nevertheless. If these native populations styled themselves after the English, they would soon accept governance by them. As a result, local dress customs were scrutinised since they provided a barometer for the success of the colonial undertaking. Yeah. So dress at the time um, across early modern Europe was not a trivial matter. It was widely accepted to anticipate the core character and behavioural traits of the wearer. Contemporaries prescribed to the idea that clothing could be national, that certain styles of hats, cloaks or boots might be English, French or Spanish. Dress was expected not only to broadcast national identity, but to imbue the wearer with the supposed character of the nation. And in the 16th and 17th centuries, this theme emerged in the popular genre of the costume book, uh, which demonstrated through illustrated figures like the ones you'll be able to see here on the screen, um, the, the characteristic national dress of different populations worldwide. Dress was a critical subject too for English colonialists who were obsessed with controlling and shaping the national character of native populations after an English model. 
Enthusiasts of Ireland's plantation system, such as Edmund Spencer, William Herbert and Fines Morrison, had waxed lyrical about the unseemly clothing and wild appearance of the native Irish, which they alleged reinforced their uncivil behaviour. Their contempt of Irish men's wear centred around two features of dress in particular, the mantle, which was a long cloak, and the glib, a popular hairstyle. These fashions were charged with posing a threat to civilised society. In Spencer's 1596 publication, A View of the Present State of Ireland, he described the Irishman's glib as a thick curled bush of hair hanging down over their eyes, monstrously disguising them. Spencer had acquired lands in the Munster plantation and harboured ambitions for the further subjugation of the Irish. For Spencer, glibs were, quote, as fit masks as a mantle is for a thief. In contemporary illustrations, the glib appears as a mop of shaggy hair with a particularly long crimp bending down over the forehead. And acknowledging that some Englishmen too wore their hair exceedingly long, it was the underhanded manner in which the Irish supposedly deployed this fashion that threatened law and order, in Spencer's view. He continued, for whensoever he hath run himself into that peril of law that he will not be known, he either cutteth off his glib quite, by which he becomes nothing like himself, or pulleth it so low down over his eyes that it is very hard to discern his thievish countenance. Now, Irish mantles were also targeted for their apparent ability to disguise the wearer. Mantles were long over garments, they lacked sleeves and fastenings, and could be pulled around the shoulder, body or head, like a big blanket. And Spencer had to admit that mantles were not exclusively Irish. They had been worn in the classical past by the Egyptians, Greeks, Romans and Gauls, he acknowledged. But like the glib, his issue was with how it could be used. In the case of the mantle, he said, to assist rebels, outlaws and thieves. The English traveller finds Morrison agreed. In the early 17th century, Morrison had served in Ireland as the personal secretary of Lord Mountjoy, the chief commander of the Crown Army. And in a paragraph deriding Irish fashions, he mocked the mantle offering bedding and shelter, writing that mantles are a for an outlaw in the woods, a bed for a rebel and a cloak for a thief, and being worn over the head and ears and hanging down to the heels, a notorious villain lapped in them may pass any town or company without being known. Worn also by women, Spencer additionally characterised mantles as garments for libidinous behaviour. He called them a cavalet for her lewd exercise, which could afterward hide evidence of a pregnancy and later provide swaddling cloths. English colonial propaganda like this constructed an image of the wild Irish and their uncivil dress to reaffirm the position of the English as a stable civilising force within Ireland. For this purpose, Irish dress had to be positioned alongside immoral behaviour, which needed to be made civilised through English intervention. It was a programme that imperfectly paved over the fact that there was already a good deal of overlap in fashions and trade in textiles occurring between Ireland and England. In reality, clothing styles were as hybrid as shifting identities on the island. And although true national dress was a fiction, it was still one that was readily lapped up by anxious colonialists. The Welsh colonist and planter in Munster, William Herbert, believed it was critical for the colonisation effort that the native Irish be subdued by wearing English dress. Herbert had come to Cork in 1587 and received much of the confiscated territory that had belonged to the 15th Earl of Desmond. In 1589, he petitioned the English government to introduce more clothing ordinances to suppress Irish dress styles. At this time, costume was considered custom. The word habit simultaneously referred to one's dress and one's habitual customary way of living. William Herbert claimed that mantles served the Irish as did a snail her shell, being a garment by day and a house by night. And by wearing this habit, he argued, they were less inclined to a loyal, dutiful and civilly life. 
who wrote, quote, by the continual gesture and wearing of rude and barbarous attire, we see the, an impression of rudeness and, barbarous, and barbarism. And by wearing civilly, handsome and cleanly apparel, receiveth a persuasion and adoption unto handsomeness, cleanliness and civility. Wearing civil dress, in other words, would enact civilised behaviour. It brought into a common trope in early modern Europe that dress not only displayed national and political allegiance, but had the power to transform it. Hearts, minds and character traits could all be manipulated through clothing. In his political treatise on the settlement of Ireland, Herbert referred to classical antiquity. The ancient Romans, he argued, had cleverly persuaded the Gauls to abandon their breaches and adopt the toga. And as a result, he said, they did not simply change their attire, but they also imbibed more refined habits and customs. Edmund Spencer echoed this, referring to the conquest of the Lydians in Anatolia by the Persian Cyrus the Great. Concluding the effectiveness of dress to transform and civilize a nation's character, he declared, it appeareth that there is not a little in the garment but to the fashioning of the mind. For William Herbert, so long as the Irish looked different to English settlers, they would act different and not accept English laws and governance. Uniformity was essential. He explained, first the common people and multitude, being more led by the eye than by any other sense, seeing us in a strange attire from them and they from us, have thereby a continual testimony in their eye that they are a different people from us and we from them strangers and aliens, which breedeth and confirmeth in them a strangeness and alienation of mind from us, our laws and government. <laughs> would serve as a uniting of minds. But this had to look English. Many commentators agreed there was nothing worse than the English corrupting their own identity by adopting Irish fashions, as the island's old Anglo-Irish families were alleged to have done. Herbert warned, colonies degenerate assuredly when the colonists imitate and embrace the habits, customs and practices of the natives. And legislation like that proposed by Herbert was issued to this end. In the late 16th century, for example, a law passed in the Gaelic neighbourhood of Irish town in Kilkenny, decreeing that inhabitants wear no apparel but after the English fashion. And the effectiveness of such laws is, to be honest, really hard to assess. But in 1620, one English observer, Luke Gurnan, wrote of the Irish that the better sort are apparelled at all points like the English, only they retain their mantle. So maybe there was some um, influence that had happened, but on the whole, it seems that most of these legislations were largely ignored, although change did, of course, slowly occur over time. But we'll move on to see how some of these ideas were then applied um, in North America. So supporters of the Irish education program had emphasised the importance of dress for offshore colonies and from the earliest moments of English colonisation in North America, dress was studied closely. The Roanoke colonist and accomplished artist John White produced detailed ethnographic watercolours of the native Algonquian population. These were published as engravings in Thomas Harriot's second edition of his report, issued from the press of Theodore Debris. The images aided attempts to convince potential investors in the Virginia Company that these people provided good government be used may in a short time be brought to civility. <coughs> the importance of observing native dress had been outlined in the recommendations given to artist and surveyor Thomas Bevan for a planned reconnaissance mission to the Americas in the early 1580s. Although this voyage never went ahead, records show that Bavin was asked to draw to life all strange birds, beasts, fishes, plants, herbs, trees and fruits, and also draw the figures and shapes of men and women in their apparel, as also of their manner of weapons in every place as you shall find them differing. This unfulfilled mission was headed by Humphrey Gilbert, 
was known for his cruel military campaigns in Ireland and his ardent support of the plantations. Gilbert intended to survey the bodies, dress and weapons of native peoples encountered in America in order to assess the viability of settlement. Colonists who later settled Jamestown were similarly instructed by the Virginia Company to scrutinise the appearance of the locals. They were said to ask, also oh, there is there, they were to look for the good air by the people for some part of that coast where the lands are low had their people blear eyed and were swollen bellies and legs. But if the naturals be strong and clean made, it is a true sign of a wholesome soil. Hairstyles, body adornment and clothing were also carefully assessed, including by Thomas Harriet, whose overall impressions of Algonquian dress is favourable, especially that worn by high ranking members of society. Describing the chiefly men of Roanoke, he wrote, they cover themselves before and behind as the women do with a deer skin handsomely dressed and fringed. Moreover, they fold their arms together as they walk or as they talk in a sign of wisdom. And of the chiefly women of Sakota, he described them to go about wearing a deer skin very excellently well dressed. Even the Algonquins tattoos were favorably received, judged by their purpose and utility. He wrote, the inhabitants of all the country for the most part have marks raised on their backs, whereby it may be known what prince's subjects they be or what place they had their original. Confirming that tattoos were no cause for concern, he added an illustration of an ancient Pict and his painted native body, commenting that these ancient Britons were at one time savages. This suggests that the Algonquins were also capable of change and could become civilized as the British had done. Now this idea reappears in the illustration of a girl from the village of Pumioak who carries a doll wearing English clothing. Harriet notes, they are greatly delighted with puppets and babes which were brought out of England. This image represent, uh, represents a tantalizing future in which the next generation might model their dress and their behavior after the English settlers. The Jamestown colonists were also mindful of local Indian dress and envisioned change. A well-known portrait of Pocahontas demonstrates this colonial aspiration in action. Engraved by Simon van der Pass after a lost painting, Pocahontas wears full Eng English dress with a lace collar, fashionable ostrich feather fan, and a felt hat. The portrait's description tells viewers that this daughter to the mighty Prince Popatan was converted and baptized in the Christian faith, um, and mentions that she is a wife of um, an Englishman. Having been abducted by colonists, married to John Rolfe, and then taken on the name Rebecca following her baptism, her dress here is the final visual proof of a civilizing process. But she is not simply presented here as Rebecca. In the frame, it is written Matawaka as Rebecca. So Matawaka as Rebecca. Michael Gaudio argues that this dramatizes the transformation that could occur through a change of clothes. Matawaka, which was Pocahontas' birth name, becomes an English Rebecca through adopting English manners and habits. And being high ranking, her example was all the more potent. But despite um, encouraging change, colonists around the James River continued to show their fascination with the dress of the Virginian peoples, particularly that of the elite. William Strachey, a settler who arrived in Jamestown in 1610, reserved a special praise for garments considered to have involved skillful craftsmanship. He described the better sort of women, as he put them, to cover themselves with, quote, skin mantles, finely dressed, shagged and fringed at the skirt, carved and coloured with some pretty work, or the proportions of beasts, fowl, tortoises, or other such like imagery, as shall best please or express the fancy of the wearer. Of men and women, he noted that the better sort use large mantles of deer skins, not so much different from the Irish phalanx, some embroidered with white beads and some with copper. 
So the Irish falling he's talking about here is um, mental. It's an Irish word for mental. He further compared Virginian and Irish dress, interestingly, identifying the leg where men and women wore in cold weather and when hunting. He called them a kind of leather breeches and stockings, all fastened together made of deer skins, which they tie and wrap about the loins after the fashion of the Turks or Irish trues. He also noted similarities between the hairstyles of married women in Ireland and Virginia. The Irish were evidently considered by Strachey as a prototype for the wild colonial subject. But he nevertheless saw much to admire, enthusing over the artisanal merit of mantles woven with feathers. Borrowing from the descriptions of Captain John Smith, Strachey wrote, we have seen some use mantles made both of turkey feathers and other fowl, so prettily wrought and woven with threads that nothing could be discerned but the feathers that was exceedingly warm and very handsome. Elsewhere, he recounted observing the dress of a chiefly woman so bedecked with jewels, she reminded him of a Habsburg princess. Her maid went and fetched the woman a mantle. He recalled it was made of blue feathers so artificially and thick sewed together that it seemed like a deep purple satin and is very smooth and sleek. The maid then fetched her water to wash her hands. Altogether, this was a ceremony that Strachey concluded showed, he said, so much presentment of civility. As Karen Cooperman has argued of this, it identifies really how gratified Strachey was to discover recognisable social hierarchies that were presented through dress and ornament. Moreover, recognising the artistry of the woman's feather mantle, Strachey could not help but to evaluate, evaluate it with familiar standards of merit, comparing it to a deep purple satin textile. And this drew upon traditional associations of the colour purple with nobility and satin with wealth and status. And while a level of admiration existed for Algonquin dress in early colonial encounters, the adoption of English dress was nonetheless encouraged. And to this end, the chief Pofatan was gifted a scarlet cloak and clothing by the English. Initially wary to wear them, his advisor reportedly suggested it would do him no harm. This was a deeply political sartorial act, however. The Irish Lord Turlick Lynach O'Neill faced a similar decision when gifted a tafta hat by the English in 1568, something he refused. But in 1578, when preparing to be granted the British title of Earl of Clan Connell, his wife accepted a gift of one of Elizabeth I's gowns. Now, so I'm just going to finish up with more of an, an epilogue than a conclusion. Um, a generation after Daniel Gookin founded his plantation on the James River at Newport News, <coughs> Daniel Gookin Jr still regarding the civilizing of the Indian population, a top priority that could be achieved through dress. Um, he, he had migrated north from Virginia to the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1644. 30 years later, he wrote about the clothing of the Indians of New England as though it was in a promising stage of transition. He said, the Indians clothing in former times was of the same mat as Adams was, skins of beasts as deer, moose, beaver, otters, raccoons, foxes, and other wild creatures. Also, some had mantles of the feathers of birds quilled artificially. He continued, sundry of them continue to this day their old kind of clothing, but for the most part, they fell the skins and furs to the English, Dutch, and French, and buy of the clothing a kind of cloth made of coarse wool. Of this sort of cloth, two yards make a mantle or cloak for men or women, and less for children. This is all the garment they generally use with this addition of some little piece of the same or ordinary cotton to cover their secret parts. So in this passage, Gurkin suggests that the wearing of skins and furs by the native population was just about relegated to history, sold to European traders instead, a more civilized enhancement of these American materials might occur, transformed into European style leather and fur lined garments as Gukin's um, readers would have been thinking about. But interestingly, 
the mantle once again became a focus of colonial energy. Feather mantles, like Strachey had described, were now a thing of the past. But interestingly, the wool cloth that Gukin claims was now used by the Massachusetts Bay Indians for mantles was also described by him as the sort used for ordinary bed blankets. And this resonates with the old trope of Irish mantles that were not simply a garment, but a shelter and a bed. The cloth mantle was now actively being encouraged as a garment for the Indian people precisely because of its practical double usage. Gukin Jr. had hoped also to clothe Indian children. He intended to propagate the gospel among the local population and proposed founding free schools. He wanted to provide each child with a blue coat once per year at the start of winter, adding that this would be sufficient clothing as little serves them. The initiative aimed to stimulate what Gukin wrote was already happening, namely that, quote, the Christian and civilized Indians do endeavor, many of them, to follow the English mode in their habit. And this was what planters in Ireland had sought for the population of Ireland around a century previous. As we saw earlier, the Munster planter William Herbert argued in 1589 that the Irish needed to adopt English fashions to enact civilised behaviour and secure allegiance to the crown. So it must have gratified Daniel Gookin Jr, son of a fellow planter of Munster, to witness this pr process of transformation over his lifetime in North America. But the colonial ideology that native Irish and American populations should confirm, sorry, conform with English habits destabilized English distinction as a colonizing force. The tense relationship between homogeneity and distinction was thematized in Ben Jonson's 1613 play, An Irish Mask at Court. The mask uses clothing as a symbol of national allegiance, with visiting Irish courtiers alternating between English citizens dress and Irish mantles as they awkwardly attempt to participate in an English courtly environment. The Irish could never quite be English, the play affirms. The unachievable challenge of assimilation was also put to the Native American populations by colonialists. Nationality <laughs> was not truly the goal so much as oppression and control. Thank you very much for listening. So now I'm going to try and unshare my screen. Yeah, that's okay. Amy. Uh, thanks for that, that was fascinating. Um, oh, you're so welcome. Yeah, just in terms of the uh, transatlantic kind of comparisons of the mantle, it's, it's, it's as good a description as I've heard. Um, okay, so we'll we'll keep questions over until the end of the until the end of the two papers. I've one or two myself, but we'll push on to uh, to Regina's paper and we'll come back obviously then for questions. Okay, so I'm gonna on spotlight the paper. Are your screen caption and Regina are you yeah hi David I'm here can you hear me uh, I can do good okay so just give me two seconds there and a spotlight grant okay so you're up there now on the main screen if you want to do you have a, a PowerPoint or I do I'll um okay I'll start uh, sharing that now okay. so let's see if we Okay, so just while you're getting that ready, I will um, I'll introduce you. So Regina Sexton, is, sorry, spotlight didn't work there temporarily. Okay, so Regina Sexton is a food and culinary historian, food writer, broadcaster and cook. She is the program manager of the postgraduate diploma in Irish food culture at University College Cork. Regina has been researching Irish food and culinary history since 1993. She has an extensive publication record covering topics from early medieval food patterns, the food and culinary cultures of the elite landed gentry to Halloween food and feasting. She is also a member of the Irish Food Writers Guild and her paper today focuses on Irish diets in the early modern period and how these changed as a result of the discovery of new foodstuffs 
introduced into Europe following the discovery and settlement of the Americas. Great, thanks very much, David. Um, and thank you for the introduction. First of all, I, uh, is my um, PowerPoint visible on screen? Uh, yeah, it's up. It's it's occupying the uh, the full spotlight. Great, thanks. Um, well, as I say, uh, thank you, David, uh, for that introduction, and also uh, thank you to everybody, and particularly the organisers, for the invitation to come and speak here today. Um, at what seems like a really uh, exciting uh, connection and one that will, I'm sure, prove more fruitful um, in, in times to come, particularly times when we can actually see each other uh, face to face. So thanks for that. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, I suppose when I first heard the, the um, you know, the subject and the topic of the webinar today, uh, the first thing that came to my mind is, is how will I, um, how will I think of food connections um, with Virginia in mind? And of course, uh, the big one that stands out in that regard is the potato. And in particular, the myths associated with the, um, the passing, I suppose, from the Americas via or through Virginia of the potato into Ireland and possibly into um, Europe. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of hover over food um, from the perspective of food as a product, uh, food trade. And I suppose the area that my own research would concentrate on more so than anything else, uh, the culinary aspects of uh, new ingredients uh, to the old world and vice versa. Um, so I'm just going to move along now and have a look. So I suppose what I do want to do, because we're talking about Virginia, is maybe to revisit the introduction of the potato myth that we in Ireland would all have heard of as uh, school Hello. children um, in this primary school. This is a question of the question, as usual. Do you remember Brian the other day about um, oh, the things from Virginia footsteps? Hi, sorry, I'm just getting a, I'm just yeah. getting um, yeah. a feed in through here. I, it's possibly somebody with their with their with their uh, mic not not muted. OK, it's gone now. Sorry, yeah, thanks. Sorry, no, that's that's the cut. Brilliant. So I suppose what I want to do really is to kind of revisit the introduction of the potato myth, given the prominence of Virginia in that myth building. Um, now, I, I mean, that that is kind of old ground, but I think it's interesting in the context of today, uh, because I suppose what I do want to to try and consider more so than the potato is the fact that this association with the potato means of, of introduction into Europe and so on tends, I think, to in, in studies and, uh, and, and research past, tends to kind of overshadow the, the, the greater circulation and the circular connections and the exchange of, of, of people, goods, animals, plants and pathogens. Um, in this whole sort of, I suppose, uh, in this whole concept of a kind of a, a Colombian change coming into the, the, the old world and a change feeding in from, from the old world into the new world as well. But I suppose the big connections from a food perspective, uh, when you think about Ireland, is uh, first of all, the potatoes, obviously, and uh, then preserved foods as seen through the emergence of the provision trade from, from the, the, the latter 17th century onwards. And then, of course, the introduction of sugar and what all that means uh, into Ireland, uh, particularly throughout the 18th century from the American plantations um, and how that introduction revolutionizes um, what people eat and how they eat in many ways. And as I say, those changes that come in in terms of growing uh, uh, wealth, uh, the growing prominence of the potato, and the emergence of sugar as an indispensable ingredient to culinary ritual, in many ways, is sort of a blueprint for how we eat today. And what's interesting, I suppose, to consider is not just these ingredients in their own right, and you'll see, I suppose, sort of a more recent research has tended to do sort of what you might call ingredient biographies, like focusing on the potato in the vein of Salomon or Austin Burke in Ireland, uh, sugar with Sydney mints and so on. But what's also interesting is the interconnections and the tie-ups between these ingredients. 
uh, to give a bigger holistic picture of what's happening uh, in society, not just culturally, but also uh, socially and, so and, and also, of course, from an economic perspective. So the interconnections are very tight and uh, they're very interesting to give us a holistic view of the connections, the interconnections between uh, the old world and Ireland in this context, and of course the new world. Um, and all of these developments led to significant transformations. Uh, the transformations may be viewed as being environmental, but for today, what I'm looking at, I suppose, is those transformations in terms of dietary practice uh, and culinary culture. And as I say, a lot of that is the blueprint for how we eat today. I said at the top that uh, as school children in Ireland, we, we all learn the sort of the, the, uh, the, the, the tradition that it was Sir Walter Raleigh uh, who introduced the potato into Ireland um, from his connections with Virginia and bringing the plant back to his, um, his, his, his home um, for some of the time, in a small bit of the time, in Myrtle Grove in Yall. Uh, so as children, we all kind of, uh, I suppose we all are convinced by this myth that it was Sir Walter Raleigh who brought the potato to Ireland. Uh, and it's remembered here, I just put it out for you here, the Crofton Croker from the Crofton Croker publication, Popular Songs of Ireland from 1886. Uh, this little ditty about the brave Walter Raleigh, Queen Bess's own knight, brought here from Virginia, the root of the delight. By him it was planted at Yall, you can see you all up here in the map, Virginia over here. Um, by him it was planted at Yall so gay and Sir Munster's praties are famed to this day. The spelling is, is, is with uh, Croker. Um, and here we have, uh, just, just to kind of give you some um, visual uh, stimulus, this is a very nice uh, um, depiction of Walter Raleigh, and I'm sure Catherine would appreciate his, his very grandiose uh, lace collar in this illustration. And over on the left of the screen is uh, Myrtle Grove, which you can still see um, close to the Collegiate uh, Church in the town of Yall today. Uh, and this is supposedly where he would have planted the first uh, tuber. Uh, I know in recent times, the connection between Walter Raleigh and uh, Myrtle Grove is even growing more tenuous. Um, but the Virginia, I suppose, uh, myth is kind of developed in various different places, not just in the Croft and Croker uh, late 19th century ditty that we've seen, um, but also in different places like in England, for example, through the work of the uh, famous uh, herbalist uh, uh, Gerard, and you can see him here in the illustration. Um, and uh, he talks about Virginia as being the natural home of the potato. Uh, just to give some sort of um, other geography background to it, uh, we know that the potato itself is in Spain uh, around 1570, possibly coming to England not too long uh, after in uh, 1580s. And then the question, I suppose, which goes back to the Walter Raleigh myth is how does it come to Ireland and from where? Uh, just have a look at John, uh, John Gerard here, because you'll see in the frontispiece of his, um, his, his herbal that he is holding a stalk of potato uh, in, in his hand, which is quite significant because in a herbal that addresses um, a, 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 a big number of plants, it is the potato that's selected uh, in this very demonstrative and uh, message filled image um, that goes with uh, Jared himself. And of course, what this is saying is um, in, the, uh, in, in the late 16th century, that this is a new item that's come from a new and strange, sometimes exotic and mysterious place of the new world. And likewise, this new ingredient is attended by those characteristics as well. And you'll see in a lot of the earlier accounts, as is typical of new of many new foods, not just the potato, but something coming from the strange new and exotic world is itself assigned a status of being an exotic in its early years of cultivation in the old world, 
uh, associated with more elite consumption patterns. And of course, like many of these new, new ingredients that are coming in to, to Europe, it will almost um, uh, by default um, assume the function of being an aphrodisiac. So the potatoes of Virginia, uh, first of all, I suppose we, we've going backwards from Croft and Croker. Uh, th this is kind of hammered home as well by, by Gerard, who we've just seen in the last slide. He talks about the potatoes of Virginia. We may call it in English, potatoes of America or Virginia. And then, of course, we have the Walter Raleigh link via Croft and Croker. Um, and, you know, there, there's, you, you, you could build, I suppose, some sort of semblance of connection given Walter Raleigh's um, adventures. Uh, into the new world uh, at various different times, be it either direct connections through voyages or through financing in the 1580s or 1590s. And on one such voyage in 1585, uh, Thomas Harriet, who again Catherine has referred to in the previous uh, paper, this is his scientific advisor, uh, with his report on new found, found land of Virginia, he con it contains a report on a tuberous plant, which is possibly the potato. Uh, but essentially, this emergence of the Raleigh myth um, seems, to, and again, this is discussed in great length by Salomon, seems to emanate from the close of the 17th century by the president of the Royal Society, Sir Robert Southwell, uh, who says of his grandfather that he brought the first potatoes to Ireland and he was given them by Raleigh after his return from Virginia, even though it's disputed uh, the fact the the the, the fact that, that Raleigh was in Virginia at all is, is a very uh, contested and disputed fact. Um, what we do know, though, aside from the origin myths and the traditions, is that, you know, as we all know, the, the potato was native to South America. Um, the uh, origin myths as well can be extended to Sir Francis Drake, and I put him in because he has a geographic connection to Carrigaline as well, in the form of Drake's Pool, which is not too far from the town. But also there is, I suppose, the suggestion that the potato comes into Ireland uh, via Spain. Uh, Salaman talks about some of the Armada stocks being washed ashore. But there's also this kind of phraseology and this term of um, spawn nakial, which is uh, the, uh, the generous of the bright spanard, which is kind of a, a term of endearment, uh, in, endearment for a white fleshed potato coming into Ireland, possibly via a Spanish connection. However, that's not for today. Uh, and all of these things are, are difficult to substantiate in terms of solid uh, factual connection and pinning down. But just for today, the, the earliest, I suppose, safe reference to the potato in Ireland is from 1606. And this is taken from the work of the two uh, retired historians from, um, from Ulster, uh, Leslie uh, Clarks and Margaret Crawford. And they refer to the earliest documentary evidence being from a lease dated to 1606, granting to Spanish immigrants in County Down, um, the other side of the country, up north, land for flax and potatoes. And certainly we know that it's been cultivated in Munster and Leinster by the 1640s. Actually, there's a connection to Burr Castle, which I'll touch on very briefly later on. And then there is also an account uh, of sort of pub talk or tavern talk from the 1660s in uh, Ireland, saying that um, we can talk of how good for an Irish context. We can talk of how good the parsnips, the potatoes, and the beetroots are that our wives had got at home. Oh, this is the men talking from, um, from the taverns, thinking about possibly what's been cooked for them by their wives at home. And as you can see, it's kind of a vegetarian setup with parsnips, potatoes, and beetroots. Uh, from a culinary perspective, one interesting uh, sort of connection with Ireland is what I would take to be one of the first culinary recipes with an Irish connection um, to the potato in Ireland. And this is a recipe, uh, as you can see it here on screen, it says to make potato pie. And this is from well, um, this is a whole kind of other, I suppose, presentation in its own right. But this is a recipe that comes from a recipe collection from Dorothy Parsons of Burr Castle in County Offaly. 
and from her handwritten collection of culinary recipes, medicinal recipes in there too, but culinary recipes from 1666. Now, it used to be, I suppose, the belief that this was one of the first uh, handwritten recipe books to be associated with uh, Ireland from the middle of the uh, 17th century. Um, you'll see others are beginning to trickle out towards the end of, of, of the 17th century, but this was taken to be one of the earliest from 1666, uh, possibly written, um, oops, possibly written in, um, Oh, where is the card? Uh, possibly written in, um, uh, sorry, I'm just getting a bit confused there. Possibly written in the castle itself in, in County Offaly. Uh, a few years ago, I spent time uh, looking at this book. And in fact, I believe now that it wasn't written in Offaly at all. It wasn't written in Ireland at all, but it was written by Dorothy Parsons, who herself was born in, in um in Burr Castle in County Offaly, but on marriage uh, she moved to England and I think it's in England that the collection of recipes was composed um, under the influence, probably the tutelage of her, uh, her, her mother-in-law, uh, also um, called Parsons, just to complicate everything. Um, but I suppose the interesting thing here is that there is a link back to Ireland uh, in, in, in this very early recipe that's dealing with potatoes. And I just read it for you because there's some interesting uh, dimensions to that recipe itself. And what it, I, you probably can't read it from the, uh, from the screen, so I'm just going to read it out here and you might be able to follow. So this is Dorothy Parsons' Book of Choice Recipes from 1666, and her recipe here is to make a potato pie. And what she says is to take two dozen of potatoes and boil them till they will peel, okay, so, so they take the skin off easily. Then slit them and being peeled in the middle um, and mashed down, you raise your pie. So she's talking about making a raised uh, pie with pastry. So raise your pie and take two pounds of butter and wash it in rose water and work it in your hands. Then lay it in a thin cake all over the bottom of your pie. Then season your potatoes with half a pound of fine sugar, two teaspoons of cinnamon, a little salt. Place in your pie, not too close, don't pack them too, too, too tightly, for you must put in between them a half a pound of the yolks of eggs, hard boiled and cut in halves. Then take two ounces of candied orange, two ounces of citron, sliced very thin, and stick them in to the potatoes. Then lay a pound of sweet butter, um, fresh butter, maybe made from uh, fresh, fresh as opposed to um, fermented cream, in the same ma manner as before, all over the potatoes. Close it up and bake it in a gentle oven half an hour before it is baked. Take it out, draw it, and put into this a caudle, half a, a pint of nagris, half a pint of, of white wine. And uh, when it boils, take it from the fire and have half, uh, and have a do not, not half, but a dozen yolks of eggs and six whites ready beaten. Stir them in, putting there to half a pound of butter and a quarter pound of more, it's coming more sugar, stirring them together till they be thick, then put it into the pie and set it in the oven together for another half an hour. And when you take it out, scrape hard sugar over it and so serve it. Now you might say why am I reading out to you a, a recipe but I find this recipe to be intriguing for the middle of the 17th century because what it is uh, in, in the first encounter obviously is it's the recipe and instruction to make uh, a pie with raised pastry with all of these ingredients, very rich ingredients in it. But I suppose what it shows you at this point, is, it's really, I suppose, what, what concerns my talk today, is the interconnectedness um, of trade between Ireland, England and Europe, and also the New World, as represented in the vast diversity of ingredients that are presented in this recipe. You have the potatoes, of course, and you have sugar, and the sugar is coming in everywhere. It's coming in to flavour the pie which is sweet and savoury, you might note. 
Uh, the sugar is also coming into the caudal that is poured into the almost baked pie towards the end of baking. And also, just to top it all off, off if you didn't have enough sugar, they're also doing a scrape of sugar on the pie when it comes out of the oven. Add to those new world ingredients, the connections uh, with Europe in the form uh, and further afield in the form of dried fruits, like the citron and the candied orange, the rose water, and further afield connections through the liberal use of spices. And these are all, I suppose, set on a platform, a domestic platform of flamboyance in the use of so many eggs and possibly freshly churned uh, butter as opposed to cured butter. And it's that aspect of one recipe that fascinates me because it really is, in this instance, the world uh, in a pie, which goes back to this idea of exchange and the Colombian exchange of connection and interconnectedness. Uh, whatever about this very flamboyant recipe with a connection to burr, but more than likely um, um, composed uh, in England by Dorothy Parsons. Um, what we do know is, and I just go very quickly through all of that, what we do know is that these new world ingredients, um, particularly the potato, will come to, uh, in time, displace older staples of an Irish dietary pattern. And those staples that you might just see on screen now, the two ones there that I suppose I want to refer to are the staples in the form of a cereal. And this instance on the left of the screen is oats. And of course, the other staple for the Irish being dairy produce in all different forms, be it fresh, fermented, um, or converted into storables like cheeses or butter. So these two staples are increasingly displaced by the, almost the colonizing influence of the potato itself as you go through time. Um, and also just not to be uh, very restrictive in this image of staples that are replaced, what we must also consider, I suppose, are staples that are more uh, closely aligned and tied into a Norman influence in Ireland. And those staples, again, on the carbohydrate side would be things like wheat, uh, maslin mixed cereal breads, and other dishes based on peas and beans, given their connection to uh, the rotations, the um, the uh, the rotation, the agricultural rotation system in the cultivation of wheat, and the addition of pulses into that. And as we do know, um, what happens through time, and as we go into the early uh, 19th century, is that this new world ingredient that Gerard is holding as a luxury exotic, will in time come to dominate the diet of the rural poor, uh, and certainly so by the early decades of the uh, 19th century, leading, of course, to um, an extremely seminal uh, occurrence in Irish history, that being the Great Famine of 1845. And I've just put in this image here, which is taken from uh, a publication of, uh, about the history of art in Ireland uh, by Claudia Kinmonth. And I put this illustration in because I suppose it demonstrates um, in a very impactful way uh, what was once a luxury and confined to the gardens. It demonstrates uh, the growing dominance, uh, uh, over dominance, uh, a move towards monoculture, food security and restrictive dietary systems of the rural poor in Ireland in the early uh, decades of the 19th century. And that's very ably and amply illustrated in, in this illustration, which is um, by an artist called Francis Topham. And the reason why this illustration is interesting is that it is um, created in 1844, which is just the year before uh, uh, the famine, the outbreak of the famine in 1845. Um, and the interesting thing about the Francis Topham's illustration is that it's taken to be the earliest um, uh, image of the potato eating ritual um, that would have been characteristic of the dietary patterns of the rural poor. And what you see here, you just go back to the house where there is, in terms of material wealth, there is nothing apart from uh, some maybe roosting hens that will give some money in exchange for eggs and so on. But there is nothing else of a material nature in, in the house uh, bar the uh, very glum and depressed concentrations of people around a few objects. And these, of course, are attending to the potato itself. This being the cauldron for boiling the potatoes, 
and after they were boiled, they're strained through uh, this basket here, like this one, which is a contemporary, um, a contemporary version of a traditional potato basket. And what you see here is the boiled potatoes uh, from the pot in the basket, and in the centre is a noggin of skimmed milk, buttermilk, sometimes simply water that might have the addition of some sort of flavouring, like pepper or salt, if these items with, were within reach. Um, and I suppose from 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 its journey in from its its native place in the Americas to Ireland in 1845, it brought considerable and um, uh, lasting uh, of, of huge consequent change, which is represented, I suppose, for the most part in this uh, illustration of of a potato diet and nothing else of the rural poor. And just to give you some uh, indication here of the consumption. Uh, quantities, just a visual demonstration as well, uh, just to kind of child's one uh, coming into to when everything else was, was sort of the other other foods and ingredients were pushed out of the diet for various different reasons. Uh, you have these huge consumption uh, levels per day per person uh, in Ireland. And the interesting thing, I suppose, about all of this is that the potato doesn't operate uh, just um, in, in, in the diet of the rural poor, even though it comes in here for very, for very interesting reasons. But it's ultimately it will ultimately tie back and come back, bring Ireland back out of Ireland again and back into the new world. And I've just taken this quotation, I won't go through it all now, from, um, from again, from um, Leslie Clarkson and Margaret Crawford from, from, their, uh, from their great book from, from uh, the, uh, Oxford University, Feast and Famine. And they're just talking about up 1845, 40% of the population living chiefly on potatoes, the emergence of a potato people and so on. But also, and this is the point, is the exports in meat, butter and grain out of Ireland uh, and increasing considerably throughout the 18th century. And the interrelationship between potatoes, uh, agricultural change, uh, uh, trade uh, and export, export back into the new world. So you have the potato coming from the new world into the old world and it's functioning here connecting back out again, which is quite interesting in this kind of circular pattern. And I suppose this is what uh, really, uh, if you just move away from product or ingredient in an individual way and consider it in the broader context of uh, what, 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 what a lot of food studies would concentrate on, and this, this is this concept of the Columbian exchange which is a term that was first coined by Alfred Crosby in his, 1950, his 1972 publication, The Columbian Exchange, Biological and Cultural Consequences of 1492. And he talks about it being a far richer and entangled picture than simply potatoes coming to Europe, potatoes coming to Ireland, in that it has consequence and story in terms of biological diffusion the global dissemination of new world foods, the interconnections between the old and the new worlds, colonization, um, and the colonization and the transmission of pathogens. So this Columbian exchange was transformative. And we cannot see from one example that it was transformative um, in moving staples like oats and dairy produce, wheat and pulses to some extent, um, into the diet of the rural poor. And of course, uh, also, it was another it, it was another carbohydrate replacing established carbohydrates, uh, wheat and, and oats, but it was also uh, very high in calories. And this is just an interesting, I suppose, illustration of um, uh, Cosby's Colombian exchange, where you see um, this kind of spread of new ingredients coming into Europe and then uh, ingredients coming out of Europe and further afield. Uh, into the new world uh, and these moving in uh, with the objective and the ambition that these will become cash crops um, and returned back into Europe again. Um, another way of looking at it, I suppose, is this illustration, uh, which demonstrates what is called the golden triangle between um, Europe, Africa and America and back over again in the in the in the form of all of these products and so on 
And I suppose for Ireland, the, uh, the big one in this regard, in this kind of circulation of goods, in many instances facilitated by the growing cultivation of potatoes, um, what's coming out of Ireland and developing, of course, is, is another food industry, and that's the provisioning industry, uh, where Irish produce um, was, um, well, well, first of all, it was cured um, and preserved to supply British and French colonies in America throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, and the market was small to begin with, uh, growing as you go through the 18th century in particular. Uh, the provision trade uh, supplied things like salted beef, uh, salted pork, salted butter, salted fish, hide, tallow skins, cheese, which is spelled wrong there, sorry, uh, beer, candles and cured tongues. And um, this produce was either shipped directly to America or to America via British and French ports. And again, another tie up, you'll see that there's an acceleration in the growth in demand for these products after the 1720s in response to the increase in the plantation of, uh, in, in the plantation, the sugar plantations outputs, which of course is meeting the insatiable greed and hunger and demand for sugar uh, back home in Europe. And in that context, just to kind of bring us back to uh, Carrie sorry, Glein, sorry, Regina, to some extent. Regina, sorry, Regina, we just finish up in two minutes just so that oh, we yeah. stay on time. Okay. Yeah, so I suppose the, the big thing for Ireland here, or for Cork, I suppose, is, is, the, is the strength of the provisioning industry out of Cork. And it's being noted for its specialist curing techniques um, when it came to salted beef that was going into the plantations um, uh, in America. And interestingly, this is just trucks's kind of, I, we won't go through that, but it's there for you to see. You can see the, how money is being made out of Ireland uh, through the provisioning industry for beef and other items. And today we sort of remember that uh, still in Ireland. And this is a, um, an image from Cork's uh, Old English Market, where you have the corned beef, which is what supported the trade, different cuts. And interestingly, uh, this other item here, which kind of does another circle of connection, and this is the emergence, uh, possibly associated very strongly with Cork. Uh, it's, it's the um, emergence of spiced beef, uh, which is kind of just a step on from making corned beef. The difference, of course, is the use of a spice, all spice. And the really interesting thing about that spice is that uh, it's one of the one of two spices only that are coming out of the Americas. Uh, all spice together with um, uh, with with uh, vanilla, uh, and I suppose the other thing I, I just wanted to to then go on to, and we I go on to that very quickly. Um, I suppose I just I'll flake through these because we don't have time. Is yeah. this kind of growing demand for sugar in Ireland? And I'm going back to Dorothy Parsons book again because what you see happening uh, from a culinary perspective from the mid 17th century onwards is that sugar is imprinting large on recipes and recipe collections like this recipe here for a plum cake for example from 1666 a potato pie we've already seen and just some sort of illustrations here of looking at just how prominent and important sugar was uh, as evidenced in the manuscript handwritten recipe books. And this is an illustration from Madeleine Shannon's uh, look at Irish manuscript receipt books, where you'll see that the concern in writing recipes is largely with sweet things. Um, and of course, this is fueling um, work back in the sugar plantations in America. And you have a growing and growing demand for sugar uh, amongst the elite classes in the first instance, and then filtering down as a uh, cultivation increases and the product becomes cheaper. Um, won't go into that, we haven't time, but I just wanted to show you this maybe as a concluding point for a number of reasons, uh, because what sugar does in the 18th century is that it transforms um, how people cooked and how they ate. And the one thing it did was that it broke the sort of the lingering medieval patterning of mixing sweet and sour spice and um, and so on in the one dish. So it, separ it aided in the separation of uh, food and dishes into sweet and savoury things. And the culmination of that, I suppose, was the emergence of the dessert course, 
which came on the back of the, um, the banqueting course of, of an earlier Elizabethan era. So the high point of the dessert course uh, in Ireland and in Europe and in Britain, of course, was um, the dessert course where you had many different things all based on sugar. Uh, and I put this illustration in from the wonderful work of Ivan Day, food historian from England. And this, I suppose, just sums it all up, is that it's not just the use of sugar in all of these different jams and preserves and cakes and creams and so on, but uh, this really striking table illustration, which is based on, it's a sugar sculpture. And the last one here, again, from Ivan Day, which will bring uh, sugar, um, Europe and America together again, is this um, sugar cake. It's a king cake for uh, New Year's Eve. That would have been traditionally, this is very flamboyant version, as you can see, of a king cake made for celebrating uh, New Year's Eve. And it's full of sugar. But the other thing that it also has here that will give us this really um, effective pink coloring is, um, is the dye, uh, Cotroneal, which of course itself is coming out of the new world and back into, uh, into the old world. And Cotroneal as a dye, you'll see from, from the accounts, was second only to silver in terms of its, its value and its appreciation and functionality in Europe. And I suppose that point illustrates that, um, you know, these connections between the old and the new world, we can think about in products, we can think about uh, in, in, in a wider deeper way in terms of Col Colombian exchange, but also there are the sort of the little micro histories that we haven't begun to think about yet uh, in terms of connection, consequence and legacy, things like kosher Neil, the dye being one of them, and of course the legacy of the traditional specialities in Cork uh, of things like corned beef, spiced beef, and a whole body of traditional ingredient, uh, awful ingredients that were surplus to the provision exporting uh, trade out of the port of Cork. Okay, so I, I leave it there, David. Apologies if I've gone over over time. Okay, so thank you very much for that, Regina. If we could all unmute and then and give Regina a round of applause for that. Very favor. So uh, questions for, for Regina or for Catherine? Right, so uh, Rachel Winchcombe. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so my question is for Catherine. Um, your descriptions of Irish dress really reminded me of earlier English descriptions of the Inuit. Um, from the 1570s and also um, descriptions of Canadians written by French explorers, so people like André Theve. Um, yes. So with the Inuit they talk about the clothing also being used for housing, for bedding, for all sorts of other purposes, which really reminded of that. And, and the language used as well, rude and barbarous, that's also what we see in the accounts of Inuit from the 1570s. So I was just wondering if you thought there was a, a broader European cultural framework that's informing both ideas of um, Irish dress and then also Virginian dress. So is this a is this a bigger European story? Is this not just a story of, um, of connections between Ireland and America, but connections between the whole European continent in terms of um, cultural understandings of dress and its use in processes of civilization? Yeah, I think that's a really good observation. Um, well, firstly, thank you for um, bringing that example to my attention because I wasn't aware of this. Um, you know, very similar descriptions being used for Inuit clothing, um, which is really fantastic, actually, for some research that I am doing. So I'll follow up on that. Um, I think you're absolutely correct. It is a wider, um, I guess, rhetoric than simply Ireland and Virginia, this idea of um, clothing that can like, also be used as part of one's daily I want to say habits of more than that yeah, this clothing, this shelter, this feeding, this everything about how one lives and how one behaves and how one um, conducts their daily life. And I think that is definitely a very clear um, concept 
and about dress in Europe at that time that was, you know, being used to discuss clothing within Europe and also abroad, um, which I think here we can really see being clearly delineated and specifically how people are sheltering themselves, housing themselves as well. So I probably didn't explain that very well, but anyway, you've really made me think about it. And yes, <laughs> thank you. So uh, Tom Heron has a, has a question. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the terrific papers and thanks, David, also for organizing this so that we in the States can participate, etc. Um, I did have a question for Catherine as well, and it, it sort of follows up on that last one, uh, which is there's a lot of um, uh, influence, of course, of classical uh, iconography and, and uh, sort of uh, traditional methods of modeling of the figures uh, in, in Harriet, uh, which seems to be also emphasized when you go from Harriet's drawings into the debris prints. So there's there's a lot of sort of sort of different stages in which we see those illustrations. Uh, so I, and also I, given the fact that they're being run through European printing houses, uh, and so have you given more thought and idea or discussion about that European legacy and the sort of preconceived notions of what people would look like in terms of the modeling and how that would influence any discussion of the exotic or or what might be realistically or not being portrayed here. Oh yes, absolutely. That's um, a very good point. Um, I mean, we can see just with the example of the people portrayed um, at Roanoke, how they start off as the fine watercolor examples with John White. The figures are much more um, classicized and idealized when debris then further engraves them. And then, of course, they were copied and copied and copied by different engravers um, as the decades went on. And they really became like this standard formula, um, like even on some of like some of the maps and things that you see in the early 17th century, these same figures from debris um, and Roanoke are appearing in the maps to do with Jamestown. So and you know it's like slightly a lot further north. So this figure becomes like a formula. Um, I think that at the time, costume books were really setting in stone some of these ideas about the, um, what am I trying to say? This idea of going back to a more simpler way of life which reminded people a lot of the um, prelapsarian times. What am I trying to say? <laughs> I'm not doing a good job of explaining this. There are similar examples showing um, or comparing Adam and Eve, for example, in this kind of nude bodily state to Indian people in South America at the time. So there's, there's this idea of like a, a simplistic nobility from a lack of civilization that was then being um, transformed into the colonial ideas about America. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that anyway. <laughs> OK, uh, so uh, Breed, Breed is a question. Yeah, uh, hi, thanks for two very interesting papers. Um, Catherine, the, I think you, if you're looking at Ireland and dress, you need to make a distinction between rural and urban Ireland at the time. Because yeah, very different cases. Was, was very different and in fact Gurnan goes into the differences between the different towns and um, what was there. But um, you might like to look at a paper I published earlier this year on dress and ethnicity in Ireland. In oh, early I would love to. That sounds right up my alley. I think you'd find a lot of the references there quite useful. So it was in the Society of Antiquaries. OK. Society of Antiquaries. Okay. Sorry. Uh, oh, that Irish. sounds perfect for me. And you might find some uh, some material there because it's it, the urban rural thing is is quite big. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, so do we have any maybe questions, a question for Regina before we, we, we draw this panel to a conclusion? I have a, a question myself, if anybody else doesn't. Just out of curiosity, have you ever um, have you ever tried Dorothy Parsons' recipe for potato pie? Hi, Davis. Yeah, I have tasted it. Um, I have. Yeah, uh, it's um, as you could see, or for, you know, from hearing the, the 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 list of ingredients, it's extremely heavy. Yeah. Um, but the other point is that it's really very tasty and very delicious, <laughs> as are uh, the vast majority of these recipes. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I ha I have I have tasted that particular recipe. <laughs> yeah. No, it was just as you were going through it. It was just it sounded incredibly rich. So it it, well, just... it is. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. It does lead on to the the it's uh, it leads on to the creation of a whole family of potato puddings. Uh, in the 18th century, which are equally rich. Um, and they remind me, for, for the most part, just to make another uh, American connection, they remind me of uh, American baked cheesecakes, actually, where the, they're so rich um, and the ingredients are so numerous that the potato is almost disguised as the ingredient, as the main ingredient in the dish, you know. Uh, so it's just operating as a carrier for luxurious ingredients and when baked it 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 the texture and the taste is, is like a cheesecake which is it's quite interesting as well all very good david yeah and all all very workable recipes actually okay um can i ask a can i ask a question <laughs> to regina yes um did you um put in the quantities there yourself like with the words teaspoon and a pound of this because what I noticed was when you said you know how it was um this network of food from all different areas from the new world from the old world and um, even from Asia and things like that I noticed you had said a teaspoon of some ingredient and I just wondered um was that your addition to it or was that actually in the recipe uh yeah, so you're hi. Um, thanks for the question. I saw your your question in the chat, and um, the the, the recipe actually doesn't have a teaspoon measure. It's a spoonfuls. A spoonfuls. Uh, so okay. it might have been two spoonfuls of cinnamon. Okay. Um, which is actually quite problematic because uh, weights and measures change a lot through time. Yeah. So the two spoonfuls could 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 be is is really open to interpretation in that instance. But um, no, that was well spotted. But uh, but it would be later on. I I think more so in towards the the eighteenth century when the material culture is surrounding the rituals of taking tea and yeah. of course taking top with coffee become uh, more diverse and more elaborate. And they go hand in hand, of course, then as well with sugar in various yeah. different guises. So it was a spoonful, I think, rather than a teaspoon. Yeah. Oh, okay. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's all. Yeah. Okay. So what we might do is um, we'll actually just extend. We're we're due a break from twenty past five to to half five, um, or twenty past twelve to to half twelve, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on. So we might just push that forward about five minutes, and we'll come back in about ten minutes for panel three, uh, starting with hiring. Okay. So thank you. And thank you, Regina and Catherine, again for, for a very, very interesting panel. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Um... <laughs> 